Today we're going to be looking at the Artillery Genius Pro. Big shout out to Artillery for sending me this 3D printer and being so patient with me with the amount of time that I've spent with this thing. Normally when I do printer review videos, I spend months with the printers to make sure that I'm giving you guys the most honest and accurate review. And in this case, I actually spent even more time with it and I'll explain why at the end of this video. Now this is the first artillery printer I've ever owned, so I wasn't really sure what to expect. Um, but I have to say when you name your 3D printer or any other product for that matter, a professional genius, and you even put genius right across the top of the product, you're setting the expectations really high. So let's see if this thing delivers or disappoints. We'll start here with the unboxing and the Genius Pro comes generously packed with quite a bit of foam and everything arrived in one piece. In the box you'll find instructions, things like the spool holder, a nice canvas Ziploc bag here with accessories and spare parts, and under that you'll find the top X gantry system, and you'll also find the base underneath of that which houses all the electronic components as well as the print bed. Despite this printer's smaller size, it is pretty heavy, so just be careful when lifting it out of the package. Looking at the base of the machine, you can see that it comes with ports for both USB and SD cards. It's got a nice ribbon cable connector here for the heated bed, and that print bed sits on top of a really nice blue anodized aluminum bracket. Before getting to the assembly, the very first thing I like to do with any new printer I get is void the warranty. So I'll cut that label and we'll take a look at the electronics inside. Upon first inspection, everything looks quite nice inside, well organized and neatly wired. We'll take a closer look now at the 32-bit main control board. You can see here all of the stepper drivers. I could not find any specific information about them online, but they are silent drivers and they do seem to do the trick. The second Z motor driver is not populated, and so the two stepper motors on this board must be driven in parallel. On the left hand side is what I believe to be a solid state relay delivering AC power to the heated bed. And that means this small heated bed is going to heat up really fast. All of the wiring and wiring management looks really nice. They use very nice connectors on the inside, and I've noticed that even in the screw terminals they're using proper ferrules. Some companies like to cheap out and use tin tip wires inside of screw terminals and that is not a very good mechanical connection. So it's nice to see here that they're paying attention to the small details. Overall, I'm very pleased with what I see and this is gonna give me the confidence to run longer prints overnight. To start the assembly, the first thing we're going to do is check the V wheels that the Y axis is running on. A common issue for this style of machine is that the printer comes out of the box with these wheels not properly adjusted. If this is your first 3D printer, these wheels can be adjusted using the eccentric nuts, usually found on one side of the printer. In this case, they're on the right hand side and you can slowly turn those eccentric nuts until you find the print bed is more stable. Do not over tighten them. If you over tighten them, the V wheels will feel like they have a flat spot on them when they're moving. Now we can install the gantry and you're going to want to take note of the connector on the left hand side of the machine. This connector will interface with the mating connector on the gantry. And so when you lift the gantry up on the same side of the printer, there'll be a connector right here that will plug directly into the one on the base. Gently lower the gantry on top of the base of the machine, align the connector and try your best to push this connector down as straight as possible not on any sort of an angle. This single connector is going to take care of all of the wiring for the print head and that is really convenient. There are four captive M5 screws in the bottom of the machine and this means that they have been pre-inserted into the base of the machine and they do not fall out so you don't have to find them in a hardware bag or anything. Just simply tighten these into the gantry at the top that you just inserted and you'll have secured the top gantry in place. As you're tightening these M5 screws down, pay attention to that connector that we just talked about and make sure that it is being drawn in very straight by these M5 screws and nothing is being drawn in on an angle. Although that connector is very convenient, we do not want to break it by forcing it in on an angle. Now we can start to assemble the spool holder and my box came with this updated spool holder assembly guide. The two identical spool holder tubes can be found in the parts and tools bag 
and those are going to sit on top of the bearings on the insides of these spool holder brackets. The tubes do not get fastened down in any way. They just sit on top of those bearings and once the entire spool holder is bolted onto the machine, they'll be held securely in place. Place the spool holder at the top of the machine and right now we're looking at it from the back side. And so there is a tab on the spool holder that slides into that blue frame and then there will be a thumb screw that secures the entire spool holder into place. Then you can grab the connector for the filament runout detection sensor and you can loop it in behind the Z-axis synchronization belt. There is a small wire retaining feature on the blue plastic where you can push the wire in and ensure that it does not eventually rub on those moving belts. Then the wire will get looped around to the front of the machine where the filament runout detection sensor resides on the spool holder bracket. Simply plug the connector into the sensor and the spool holder is taken care of. Next, you can remove the tape on the various connectors attached to the base of the machine. There will be a connector on the left hand side of the machine and right hand side of the machine. Two of those are intended for the Z stepper motors and so those will plug directly into those stepper motors. We're looking at the printer from the back right now and what you'll also notice is a small three pin connector coming off of the gantry and that one's gonna get plugged into the receptacle on the base of the machine. That three pin connector is responsible for the filament runout detection sensor that we just installed. On the other side of the printer, there's an additional connector that will go unused and according to this sheet here, it's for an end stop. The Genius Pro comes with a BL touch like probe on the print head and that's gonna take care of the Z homing position. If this auto bed leveling probe wasn't present, then I suppose you would need a regular Z end stop and that's what that connector would be for. So we're just gonna leave it taped down. With the wiring now complete, check that the V wheels are tight on the print head and you can see here that mine are loose. This can easily be fixed by adjusting the eccentric nut on the bottom V wheel. You can manually spin the Z-axis lead screws to increase the height of the X-axis so that you can reach underneath with a wrench and make adjustments to that eccentric nut. Using the same approach as we did with the print bed, make small adjustments until all of the play in the print head is removed. Just a friendly reminder here that tighter is not better when it comes to V-wheels. Over tightening those V-wheels will lead to premature wear of the V-wheels themselves and when you go to slide the print head back and forth, you'll feel like there's a flat spot when those wheels are too tight. Ideally, the motion should be very smooth and there should be no play back and forth or side to side in that system. The Z-axis also runs on V-wheels and I noticed that my assembly had a little bit of play in it. The manual mentions some kind of adjustment on the inside of these plastic brackets where I've put red circles but for some reason my assembly looks different than the one in the manual and I've tried adjusting with no luck. I also noticed that there was a fair amount of play between this blue plastic retaining piece and the brass lead screw nut. The entire x-axis gantry sits on top of this lead screw nut and I'm assuming gravity should just take care of this play in the system but we'll see how this turns out with the print quality later on. The screws that I've circled here in this clip attach the black plastic to the blue plastic and have no bearing on the amount of play in the system. Trust me, I tried tightening those as well. Finally, don't forget to switch the power supply voltage over to the mains power supply voltage that is applicable for your country. Now we're ready to remove the protective layer off of the touchscreen, any stickers that are stuck to the print bed, and our assembly is complete. If I wasn't filming this whole process, I would estimate that this would take me about 15 minutes to get this whole printer put together. Over the course of my 3D printing adventures, I would say that I've put together about 15 to 20 unique printers, and this one's at the top of the list for one of the easiest to assemble. This is largely due to the very thoughtful and clean wiring setup of this machine. Before we can start printing, we still need to level the print bed, and to do that, of course, we need to turn the machine on. Once the machine is on, you can head into the menu and we're going to preheat the print bed. To do this, go into the tools section, select heat. 
And this part here was not very intuitive to me at first because I did not see anything about the bed. So you have to actually press on the extruder to toggle between the bed and extruder heat settings. Pressing the little thermometer icon will toggle between the increments of which you want to increase or decrease the temperature. As I mentioned at the beginning, the heated bed is an AC powered bed, so it will heat up very quickly. The manual also suggests heating the nozzle up for the bed leveling process, but from my experience, I find that this is less critical than the print bed. Press the back button and then head into the leveling section where you will be presented with five different options. I'm gonna start with the fifth, which is the center of the print bed, and then you'll see the print head move to the center of the print bed, use the auto bed leveling probe, and probe the center of the print bed, and then move the nozzle to the center of the print bed. Then we can grab our piece of paper, which we will be using essentially like a feeler gauge. We can test the center of the bed, and then use the buttons on the touchscreen to move the print head to the four corners of the print bed. And again, using the piece of paper like a feeler gauge, testing the distance between the nozzle and the print bed using the piece of paper. I've obviously sped this clip up, but if you pay close attention to what I'm doing with the buttons, sometimes I am pressing the same button twice. And what that's going to do is that's going to raise the nozzle back up and put it down into the same position giving you a very short window of time to slide the piece of paper between the nozzle and the print bed. When the nozzle starts getting really close to the point where the piece of paper starts dragging between the nozzle and the print bed, you'll find that it's very difficult to slide the piece of paper between the two without lifting the nozzle back up. Work your way around the print bed several times, making small incremental adjustments at each corner. It doesn't matter which 3D printer you're doing this to, you do not want to adjust one corner too much all at once. It may not be as big of an issue on a small print bed as it would be on a larger print bed, but if you make too much adjustment to a single corner all at once, you may start to introduce bending or twisting to the print bed. That bending or twisting may be very difficult to work out of that print bed without having to release all of the tension off of those bed leveling springs. Don't forget to occasionally bring the print head back to the center of the print bed to test that distance from the nozzle to the print bed at the center position. There should be a medium amount of drag between the paper and the nozzle at all five positions on the print bed. And once you achieve that, you can head back into the menu, hit more, and then you can hit auto level. Wait for the printer to probe all of the positions on the print bed and then we can get into making fine adjustments of the Z offset. Just don't forget to hit that EEPROM save button each time we make adjustments to the auto bed leveling or the Z offset. Now in the same menu, you can select the Z equals zero button. And what that's going to do is that's going to put the nozzle in the Z zero position at the center of the print bed. It would be understandable to think that you'd have been done at this point because you've manually leveled the bed and you've allowed the printer to probe all of the points on the print bed. But in fact, you do still need to adjust the Z offset. And so by putting the printer in the Z equals zero position, what you are going to do now is make small incremental adjustments to the distance between the nozzle and what the probe understands as Z equals zero. And those incremental changes will be made in values of 0.025 millimeters, as they can be seen on the buttons on the touchscreen. Make the adjustments with the piece of paper stuck between the nozzle and the print bed. After each adjustment, give the piece of paper a small tug and try to achieve that original drag that you had between the piece of paper and the nozzle when you did the original manual bed leveling. When you're happy with the results, press the EEPROM save button to save that new Z offset value. And if this is your first printer and you're very unfamiliar with how that piece of paper should feel between the nozzle and the print bed, don't worry because you can make these changes on the fly during the first layer of a print later on. Now we need to load in some filament and you can click on the tools section and then change. And then there's a button on the left hand side that says in. This is going to start the process of preheating the nozzle, and while that's happening, you can take a roll of filament and set it on top of the spool holder. 
route the filament down and through the filament runout detection sensor as pictured here. Once the nozzle has reached about 200 degrees Celsius, you can now release the tension in the extruder by pressing on the lever and feeding the filament through by hand. Keep feeding the filament through until you see it come out of the nozzle and you have now primed the extruder. Now you can load a G-code file onto the USB stick that comes with the printer, plug the USB stick in, and navigate through the menus to your file that you want to print. The very first file that I'm printing here is going to be a calibration cube. Now this video clip here is legitimately the very first file that I've printed on this 3D printer. And so you can see with the previous steps that I walked you through how easy it is to get started with this printer and find success in your very first print. During the first layer of your print, if you are finding that you are having first layer adhesion issues, this is where you can go back into the menu and make those small changes to your Z offset. If the nozzle is too far away from the print bed and the filament is not sticking at all, then you're gonna to wanna to move the nozzle down closer to the print bed. And if you have too much squish going on, then you can use the up button to move the nozzle up a little higher. Doing this while the printer is laying down that first layer is very convenient because you immediately get to see the effect of the changes that you're implementing. While this first print is running, I wanna briefly talk about the slicer settings. And so I normally use Prusa Slicer for all of my 3D printers. And normally what I have to do is make custom profiles for each of those printers. What was really nice about the Artillery Genius Pro was that within Prusa Slicer's configuration wizard, the standard profile for this printer worked fantastic out of the box. The only setting that I found that I had to change was the Z hop value. So within Prusa Slicer, they have it set to a default of 0.6 millimeters, which I thought was a little bit excessive, and I just dropped it down to 0.3 millimeters. All of the pre-configured print settings within Prusa Slicer were also very good for this machine. And over time, I found that I was using the 0.2 millimeter layer height speed profile the most. Within that profile, I've really only had to play around with the typical settings like infill percentage, infill type, and perhaps the number of vertical and horizontal walls, depending on the part that I'm printing and the application. The calibration cube print went off without a hitch, and I should mention here that this is being printed with a pretty standard PLA plus material. I did not have to use any adhesion promoter on the print bed, and when I let the print bed properly cool, the print was very easy to remove. Looking at the cube up close, all of the corners were very sharp, the text was also clean and sharp, and I didn't see any signs of ringing or ghosting. The nominal dimensions of these calibration cubes are 20 millimeters in all directions, and using a set of digital calipers, I was able to verify that the printer was very reasonably accurate. At different points across various faces of the cube, I did not see any deviation over 0.1 millimeters anywhere. Therefore, I was very happy with the result and I was ready to move on to bigger and more complicated prints. The next model I'm gonna be printing here is this piggy bank. And the purpose of printing this model is to test things like support generation, as well as bridges and small overhangs. The Genius Pro comes with a pretty respectable 4020 radial part cooling fan, and it seems to handle the bridges and overhangs quite well. As the part was progressing, I could tell that the details were coming out very sharp and that there was no loss of detail in the part. The support material under the pig's nose was very easy to remove, and the very steep overhangs at the top of the part and at the back on the tail were clean with no sagging plastic. I did read some reviews online about this printer and some people had mentioned things about strange Z banding artifacts. I did not experience anything of that nature on my machine and I was very happy with how the layers looked. The only very small issue that I had with this part was a very fine amount of stringing between the holes in the part. And if you look very closely, you can see those very fine wisps of plastic. Fortunately, this is very easy to fix with a heat gun. You blow a little heat at those things and they go away. These next parts here are what I like to call gaming chair cups or office chair cups. 
and the purpose of them is to sit under the wheels of your gaming chair or office chair and prevent that chair from rolling around. If you're into gaming or sim racing, I sell these parts on my Etsy store. I'll put a link in the video description down below. And as you guys would know, if you were doing any sort of sim racing, you'd be pressing on those pedals. And if you had a chair with wheels, that chair would be rolling around everywhere. I print these parts in high temperature, high performance PLA because they will have to bear the weight of the person plus the gaming chair that the person is sitting in. These parts are also customized for the size of the wheels on the office chair or gaming chair, and I can also put the person's gamer tag on one of the faces. The Genius Pro is able to handle the higher temperature printing requirements for this material without issue, and the text on the gamer tag came out very clear and very sharp. The overall part quality was excellent, and I felt very comfortable with selling these parts and shipping them to a customer. This next print is a nice example of printing threads on this machine, and these square threads turned out awesome. The parts being made here are part of my Creality Smooth Spool Holder modification, and I have a video on that as well, so you can click that link in the top right hand corner of the screen if you're a Creality owner. But basically the long bolt, and there's a nut in the background that you can't see there, they will thread together, and if the tolerances of the printer are not great, of course they won't thread together. Printing threads, especially large threads like these, require the printer to be able to do very steep overhangs. I'm hoping in this clip you can see just how crisp those overhangs came out, and they are absolutely perfect. These parts were printed in regular PLA+, so it's not a particularly difficult material to print with, however it was suitable for the application. When testing this printer, I never really got into any sort of exotic materials, but PETG is a very popular material these days as an alternative to PLA, and these parts here were printed in some pretty basic PETG. If you've never printed in PETG before, it is trickier than PLA, but it's not necessarily a factor of the machine not being able to print in this material. It requires a slightly higher print temperature, but it's more about dialing in a lot of the print settings. For example, PETG typically requires different retraction settings because it's more susceptible to oozing, and it is more picky when it comes to first layer adhesion. And so the nozzle has to be a very specific distance away from the print bed as it's much less forgiving. With the Artillery Genius Pro, I'm happy to report that printing in PETG was very straightforward. Again here I used a lot of these standard profiles right out of Prusa Slicer and the parts came out looking great. Oddly I did not have to play with any of the retraction settings and perhaps that's due to the direct drive extruder. Direct drive extruders inherently use smaller retraction distances and therefore you could say that they are less sensitive to retraction issues. Perhaps this is why printing in PETG was very straightforward. Up until this point I've given this printer a glowing review and I think it's fair to say that I really love this machine. I have no major complaints, but there are a few minor annoyances. One of them is the fact that the print bed is fixed in place. The glass cannot be removed and it doesn't come with a flex plate, and so you have to wait for that print bed to completely cool down before you can remove your prints. It's great that first layer adhesion has never been a problem with this print bed, but it does become a little bit annoying when you're trying to bang out a lot of prints back to back because you have to wait for that print bed to cool down before you can release your print. Another minor criticism is the position of the filament runout detection sensor and the sequence when the printer goes to home itself. After finishing a tall print, the printer parks the gantry pretty high up on the z-axis. Then when you go to start the next print, the printer goes to home itself, but instead of going down, it travels up a few millimeters first. This can sometimes pinch the filament between the extruder and the filament runout detection sensor. If you're using filament that is slightly brittle, this could cause it to break and then you have to cancel a print and reload the filament. And finally, the touchscreen interface is a bit basic. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not really one for fancy frills and features. I would much prefer ease of use and reliability, but to be fair, compared to some of the other competitors comparable printers, I do feel like this touchscreen interface could use a little bit of a refresh. 
Some of the options and menus are not the most intuitive to use, and maybe it's just the presentation or the icons, but I do feel like it's slightly out of date. Artillery could probably address this with a simple firmware update on the screen. So at the beginning of this video, I had mentioned that I had planned on doing a long-term review on this printer, and it ended up turning into a long, long-term review of this printer. And the reason for that was that I was trying really hard to just find something that I hated about this thing, or to have that sort of aha moment where something broke. Um, but on the contrary, this printer has been just dead nuts reliable, and I gave up waiting. I couldn't wait any longer, so I had to just release this video. I've never had to service this machine in any way. I haven't had to touch even the bed leveling knobs once. The only thing I've had to do since owning this machine and after that initial setup was to rerun the bed probing sequence just one time. I feel like this is a 3D printer that I would be very confident recommending to a beginner, someone just getting started with their 3D printing journey. Uh, because of the ease of setup, the reliability, and the ease of use with all the slicer profiles that seem to work great right out of the box with minimal tweaking. Before I received this printer, I had planned on designing a bunch of upgrades for the machine as I went along and identified deficiencies in the design. But as it turns out, it's so well equipped that I really have not found anything that I want to do to it just yet. It's been printing so well as is that I just haven't touched it. Uh, it comes with an all metal hot end, direct drive extruder, the dual Z motor setup, the auto bed leveling sensor and even the wire management is really well done with all the ribbon cables. It's very neat and tidy. The price point of this machine is also very competitive to other brands with similar offerings and Artillery often runs sales on their website. So you can find this thing for a very reasonable price and you won't have to spend any additional money on upgrades because as I just said, the thing is so well equipped. And the big thing is you won't have to spend time doing it either. And Somebody like myself, I do really enjoy tinkering with the machines, tearing them apart, and building them up to be something better, but it can be very inconvenient to have your printer in a million pieces on your workbench. Overall, I would say that this is probably the closest thing to a consumer grade printer that you can just take out of the box and start printing with almost straight away with minimal technical knowledge of 3D printing. Thank you again to Artillery, and one more apology to you guys for taking so long to get this video out there but your printer was an absolute pleasure to work with. And thank you guys for sticking with me through this whole video and making it up until this point. If you guys wanna check out my website, embracemaking.com, please go ahead and do that. Also, please subscribe to this channel if you're looking for more content like this. I really appreciate any sort of engagement with my content. It goes a long way in supporting me and my channel. Thanks for watching.